Good morning. Hey, fantastic. It's so nice to be in a room full of human beings. This is, oh, you're going to hear this all day today. All the, all the speakers are like really excited to be back and like, oh, it's real people instead of my computer screen at home and a camera. Um, and I get feedback and oh, it's very exciting. Um, I am really, really excited about what I'm going to talk about this morning. I usually get excited about things. Um, about a year and a, a year and a half ago now, maybe a bit less, I accidentally made something up. Um, it's called Cupid. So what I want to do this morning is explain a bit about why I made it up and then what's been happening in the year since I made it up and uh, tell you what it is. And uh, my goal with this is for you to tell me what you think, okay? I am here pitching an idea, if you like, um, pitching a model, and my goal is feedback, okay? So I really, really want to hear what you think. I will try and have some time at the end for questions. Anyone who's been to my talks before knows the, the diminishing likelihood of that. But um, anyway, so, so let's, let's start. Let's start a, a way back. Where did this come from? This came from... Um, actually, it came from NDC. In fact, it came from NDC in 2017. And after NDC, there is um, there's an event called PubConf. What's happening here? My clicker is doing strange things. Luckily, whoa, I have a backup clicker because these people are so organized. Watch this. Wow. Thank you, organized AV people. I love you. So uh, PubConf. PubConf is a, it's, it's a kind of tongue-in-cheek after-party thing for NDC. And the rules are, it's, it's a brilliant idea, the rules are you didn't go to NDC, right? You can only go, so it's for people who couldn't get tickets, because NDC usually sells out. Um, it's quite an expensive event to go to, particularly if you're funding yourself. And so a couple of folks put together this idea of, of NDC, of, um, of PubConf which is they grab some speakers from NDC and you give a five minute talk. And it's a five minute, what's called an Ignite style talk. So an Ignite talk is you have 20 slides and they advance automatically every 15 seconds, okay? And you can write your own talk, which is what I did, or they do you nowadays, they do this like an improv type of thing. So they just throw some slides at you and they just keep changing and you have to riff along to those. Anyway, they said, look, Daniel, do you want to come, do you want to give a talk at, at PubConf? And I, stupidly said yes. It turns out the amount of work that goes into a five-minute talk is mind-bogglingly more than goes into a one-hour talk. So I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. Um, in particular, what I was thinking about was SOLID at the time. So those of you who don't know, SOLID is an acronym made of five principles, um, originally uh, written up, documented, communicated by Robert C. Martin, and when he was working at a company called Object Mental, which I think he founded, um, so he's working with a chap called Mike Feathers, who wrote the brilliant Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And Mike Feathers noticed that if you rearrange the first five of these principles in a particular order, it's spelt solid. And these are the single responsibility principle, the open close principle, Liskov substitutability principle, interface uh, segregation principle, and dependency inversion. There we go. I just, I've said them so many times now. I, um, I still can't tell you, no. Um, so anyway, and I had been looking at these, and the main reason I've been looking at these is this, is I've been writing software in various forms, um, various kind of guises for about 30 years. And I looked at Solid, and the problem I had with it, it was like, it's neither necessary nor sufficient. So for each of those things, um, I can take a look at single responsibility principle, or interface segregation, or whatever it is, and I can say, yeah, there are a bunch of places where I wouldn't bother doing that. And there's a bunch of places where if I did that, I'm still in trouble. Or ironically, I'm in more trouble. Right? And I'll explain that in a second. Anyway, so, I, so the reason I wanted to talk about Solid at this talk, um, at this PubConf talk, was because I'm lazy. And my plan was this, Solid, five things. Okay? One slide to introduce it, 15 seconds. One slide to disagree with it, 15 seconds. One slide to say what I do instead, 15 seconds. That's 15 slides. Top and tail it, I'm done. Right? And so I did. And we did this pub comp thing, and it was fun. And you know, lots of people drank beer and stamped their feet, and it was awesome. And then I did a, made a fatal mistake of putting the slides online. <laughs> At which point, the, the craftsman, the software craftsman, which is the secret name of the uh, Bob Martin solid cult, 
came after me with pitchforks and boy, they were cross, but they were cross in a spectacular self own kind of way. So there were some brilliant, you know, when I say brilliant, I mean spiteful, ad hominem blog posts about why every element of Dan North is wrong. Um, but they, you know, even in the way it was written, said, you know, this man just makes stuff up and has straw man arguments, whilst making up straw man arguments about what I'd said. You know, and this person doesn't even bother contacting the author of the, without contacting me. I'm like, I don't need to respond to your post because you already did, right? Um, anyway, some people got cross. So, and that was it. That was what all I thought was going to happen until last February. So February 21. Um, there's Extreme Tuesday Club is, I think, the longest running XP or Agile kind of meetup in the world, certainly one of them. Started in the early 2000s in London in a pub. And a lot of this takes place in pubs, as I'm saying this out loud. Uh, um, so uh, uh, the Extreme Tuesday Club has now moved online because pandemic and world's ending. And so they happened, that topic that week happened to be solid. And one of the organizers contacted me and said, look, you know you did that, that thing where you poked at solid a couple of years ago. I was like, yeah. Well, we're talking about solid. If you're not a fan of solid, what would you have instead? I was like, that's a really good question. Like, maybe I can come up with five principles that aren't solid. And then I was like, you know, there's a bigger question, which is, are there, are there five principles that are universally applicable to software? Right? Is that even a non-question, right? And so I came up with Cupid. And I came up with Cupid deliberately. Firstly, it was near Valentine's Day, right? But also I wanted something that was so not solid, right? And that the kind of the, 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 um, the code craftsman bros would just go, oh, no, that's just too, no, I'm not going to say that. Um, and the great thing about this, and Kevin Henney will tell you this as well, because he's done this, is when you start with an acronym and then make up the thing, it's called a backronym, okay? It, you, you, you end up in a world of fun because now you've got loads of candidates for each of the letters. And there's a whole load of blog posts that I haven't written about some of the kind of the, the runners up, if you like, the shortlist for some of the letters and why I ended up with the ones I've got. And so anyway, so that's where it happened. And then what I did is I became, um, and this is how most of my work I've realized over the years, most of the stuff I produce is for other people's deadlines. I have my own deadlines, they go whooshing past, right? When it's someone else, when they say, can you come and speak at our conference? I'm like, yes, of course. Crap, I've got to put something together now. <laughs> so now I had to explain what this was. So, um, so I'd say this was early, early, to, um, early 20, uh, 2021. And then I started talking about it. And then I started talking about it and talking about it. And I got some really, really good feedback. And it was really encouraging and I got excited about that. And then I finally, a year later, wrote it up. Really, I've been threatening to write up Cupid for a while. I finally wrote it up. Um, and it appeared on the front page of Hacker News. Now, I, I didn't post it. I, I don't actually read Hacker News, but it's something that happens. If someone posts your stuff and you end up on Hacker News, suddenly you get a lot of traffic to your website. So there I was, slightly disappointingly, on the 15th of February. But I know, off by one error, right? But, um, but that was fun. And then the maddest thing happened. Um, the maddest thing is that I'm now on ThoughtWorks Tech Radar. OK, so, so this kind of riff on an idea. And it turned out, and it's not, you know, OK, I can sort of be all humble bragging and all that. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And the reason it's ended up there is because it does resonate. It's resonating with a lot of people. And the feedback I'm hearing is we're using this. We're using this model, we're using this way of articulating code um, in our day jobs, and it's helping. And so that makes me very happy. Um, and then, so that's what happens to your website, right? So well, I'm not very good at websiting. I'm not very good at, um, you know, I don't have a newsletter, I don't blog regularly, I'm really infrequent. And then, so what happens is you end up with like, you can see 50,000 views, uh, 61,000 views. Um, News.y combinator, so that's Hacker News, 10,000 visitors from that one post. Um, and then Twitter, ThoughtWorks, that's the tech radar, a couple of thousand from there. So suddenly you get all this traffic and then crickets. <laughs> so my website is mostly crickets. So, okay, what I want to do before we get into the Cupid acronym itself is set the scene a bit. Um, who are we writing code for? When we write software, who are we writing code for? That's a question you can call things out. Compiler. Compiler. You're writing code for compilers. Yep. Okay, that's true. 
Future me, I think is my favorite answer to this. Future me, yes, future me, you're writing for who else? Other developers. Um, this Martin Fowler pretty much opens the refactoring book, 1996, with this quote. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand, compilers, right? Good programmers write code that humans can understand. And I remember not just the idea of refactoring, that was really profound for me, that statement, I probably came across 20 odd years ago or something, that statement has just stayed in, in my, you know, the back of my head, in my operating memory ever since. What I also realized, again, because when you start giving talks about things, you think about them more deeply and you iterate on them, is one of the reasons that Solid itself, and you know, I, again, I, people say I bash Solid, I don't. I think Solid of its time was brilliant, right? Of its time, the way we thought about software in the late 80s, early 90s, software was something that you'd build and then you put it there and you build the next thing, you put it there. And so code files, source files, typically C, C++, files um, were, were you know, write only. You know, you'd write it and then you'd move to the next thing and you'd layer and layer and layer. And what that meant is that um, going back and changing things was un unusual and typically risky. Also, people didn't tend to sit together. We hadn't really co-located people by this point. So something like, um, you know, the idea of single responsibility, separate UI logic from business logic from data access isn't really so much about code as about the human dynamics of this. The, the people changing that code are likely in different teams, right? And they're not gonna to talk to each other because they're not allowed to talk to each other because that's how the organization is structured. And when something needs to change, it probably needs to change in all three of those places. You change the data and you change the rules about that data and you change how it looks. But different people are gonna do that work. And if they're all tromping over the same source file, that's bad, okay? So something like single responsibility is a way of protecting ourselves against, parentheses, something that no longer exists, right? Likewise, Liskov substitutability. If you have subtypes, make them, apply the principle of least surprise. Don't make them be uh, pathological compared to their supertypes. First thing, the clues in the word types. This is not about hierarchical class-based OO languages. This is about type systems, but viewed through a, C++ lens, it looks an awful lot like subclasses, right? And also, we don't really do that so much. You know, we've all decided, or most of us have decided, that composition is a much better way of putting code together than inheritance. So we've got really good advice for something we don't really do anymore. And what occurred to me recently is this refactoring largely makes the, makes the rest of Solid redundant, right? We were scared of changing code, and Solid was about making code more stable, right? Making it more, more, more resilient because we didn't want to go back and muck around with it, or if we did, we wanted to be safe doing it. And then refactoring said, honestly, it's like clay, you'll be fine, right? And the patterns that Martin came up with in the 90s became the tooling we use now, became, you know, Alt-Shift F7, we don't even think about it now, right? Refactoring, deterministic AST-based refactoring is muscle memory, wow, right? Anyway, so, I looked at that and I was like, understand. Can we do better than understand? I mean, understand is table stakes, right? And then um, again, Kevlin, I'm gonna name check Kevlin because he introduced me to this quote. Um, and then I went and read the paper, the article by Dick Gabriel. Um, so the paper is called Habitability and Piecemeal Growth. And there's a whole set of like an anthology of papers called Patterns of Software from again, the 90s. And Dick Gabriel, this is just, it's a beautiful piece of writing. Go and read the whole article. He says this, he says, habitability is the characteristic of source code that enables, and he lists a whole bunch of different kinds of people, to understand its construction and intentions and to change it comfortably and confidently, okay? And then he says, habitability makes a place livable like home. And that really, again, resonated with me because we as programmers, we live in that code, right? If you live in a messy home, um, that's really hard to get anything done in, you're gonna just feel that drag all the time. If you live in a home full of booby traps, right, then, then you're gonna kind of not really wanna open doors too often, yeah? And so I thought, oh, habitability, habitable. That sounds better than understandable. What about joyful? What if we could go beyond habitable and code that just makes you happy, right? Uh, just a quick straw poll, who here, 
has, and I'm looking across the room and I'm seeing, it's quite interesting actually, NDC is an interesting demographic. I'm seeing quite an older demographic here. I'm gonna, this is quick, hands up if you've been coding more than 10 years. Well, uh, over about two thirds of the room. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. 15 years. 20 years? Yeah, about a third of the room, more than 20 years, thank you. So, okay, all the people in the room, put your hand up if you have experienced joyful code. You've gone into a code base, an unfamiliar code base, you like with trepidation and fear and all those usual f emotions, and you've gone, wait, this looks awesome. I, I understand this, I, I don't, put your hands up if you've, if you've had that experience. Oh, depressingly few, non-zero, which is great, but I'm gonna say less than 10% of the hands, right? Isn't it a great feeling, right? Wouldn't it be nice to give that feeling to someone else? Think about a code base that's been joyful to work with, right? Can you describe, can you articulate what makes that code base joyful? Is it a just, it just was, it's just a hunch, it's just a feeling, just is how we, it's a diminutive applied to instinct, applied to feelings, because as logical, rational humans, we don't like to think that feelings are first class actors in our lives. Spoiler, they are, right? We all make predictably irrational decisions. Can we describe what makes it joyful? And, and what kind of properties does, does joyful code have? And I'm using the word properties very deliberately here. I tried thinking of principles, and what I realized is I don't think in principles, okay? And then it occurred to me that maybe we don't think in principles, we just kind of have them inflicted on us. Let me explain what I mean. Principles are basically rules. They're guidelines, right? Do these things. So they give you conditions, they give you boundaries, okay? And you either conform to the condition or it's wrong. So this wonderful chap, Paul, Paul Hebert. And Paul Hebert's a missiologist. I learned this word a few years ago. Missiologist is someone who studies missionaries, Christian missionaries. And he's working for various church organizations and he's looking at missionaries in different contexts. And he's trying to see as an anthropologist, is there what makes some missionaries more successful than others? You know, they go into a community, they're welcomed by the community, they figure out how to all get along. They, you know, there's lasting change in that community versus people who go in typically kind of, you know, like the, the colonial sort of go in and, and, and impose their thing on someone. And also, typically, as soon as they leave, it just regresses. They're like, have they gone yet? Oh, thank heavens for that. Right, as you were, everyone. And he came up with this idea, he's a mathematician as well, so he came up with this idea of bounded versus centered sets, or bounded versus centered communities. And the idea is this, is with a bounded set, you have boundary markers, and boundary markers might be the clothes you wear, the, uh, the food you eat or don't eat, rules you follow, vocabulary. Vocabulary is a great boundary marker if you know the words, right? Do you, know, do you use the same utterances as me? And what happens with a bounded community is you spend all of the time, the, the community spends all the time guarding its boundary. Certification is a brilliant boundary marker. You have a scrum certificate or you don't, right? So, and then, and then you guard the boundaries and you forget why you even had the set. You forget what the community was about because everyone's now about guarding the boundary. A centered community is more kind of values based. It says, this is what we believe. Um, you, there's no outside <laughs> and there's no inside. There's just closer to or further from, okay? And wherever you are, you can always move closer to and wherever you are, you can always move further from. And he found, he found that, his research found that missionaries who create centered communities, they were much, much more resilient, long lasting community, they long outlasted the missionary. And that sense of belonging and centeredness and having shared values, again, you'll see this in open source communities, the ones that are thriving and active and exciting and all of those things. I see this in the Cucumber community, right? The BDD tool, Cucumber. Um, I'm not a community builder. So when I see it in other people, I think it's astonishing. John Skeet is a brilliant community builder. So as like Hellasoy started this thing and Matt Wynn came along later, and what they do is this, they've got these mailing lists and you join the mailing list and someone asks a beginner question. Now, I grew up with Usenet in the 90s, right? And, and immediately it was like, read the FAQ. You know, read it, well, who are you? Read the FAQ. And in fact, typically when you join the mail, a news group, the, you get an automated mail saying, here's our FAQ. There's 200 questions. You're like, oh crap. Um, what happens in the cucumber list, and it's a great thing to watch, is people ask the same questions again and again and again, and every time someone like Aslak or Matt or someone says, hi, welcome to the community. Let's talk about your question. 
And you're like, the patience of these people. But also the impact that has on the community, because now everyone else in the community does that too, right? So centered communities are much, much more value-based communities, are much more powerful. So properties now are qualities or characteristics. These describe the center. They define a goal or a center, and our code is only ever closer to or further from. It's not wrong, right? So what you get with principles and boundaries is police, and you get the solid police, yeah? Um, let's turn my phone off. Um, and, you know, and, and solid police come and go, that's not, that's violating the single responsibility principle. And they have their checklist. <laughs> You're in violation and they ticket you. So with a, with a property based, um, you know, the set of properties rather than principles, you're only ever closer or further. And then it gets a bit meta, right? If we're going to have properties, what properties should those properties have? Yeah. Uh, so I want them to be practical. I don't want abstract, arcane, complicated, any of that stuff. I want it to be easy for me to describe them and easy for you to describe them to each other, to articulate. Easy for you to assess. Hey, look, you know, how to what extent is our code this? And easy to adopt. It's not an all or nothing thing. It's a, just take whatever you need and it might be helpful. Um, I want to be human. And this is a very deliberate term. So if you look at Solid and a lot of these other kind of code health things, is from the perspective of the code. So I want to look at this from the perspective of human beings, of us as human being programmers looking at code, working with code. So for instance, again, single responsibility principle is a great example. It's about how the code changes, reasons for the code to change. Code should have one reason to change, okay? It's not necessarily about you working with that code. And the third thing I want is a bit of nuance. So, you know, Programming isn't black and white. Properties aren't black and white. You know, as I said, it's, there's, there's a whole load of nuance moving towards. What I want is that I can teach this to junior programmers, to novices, to people who've never programmed before and say, hey, look, here are some things to think about code. And you can look at code and you can have opinions, right? And, and it might, you know, this might be useful for you. But then once you've been around for a bit and you're like, but why is it? Let's, let's, uh, let's dig into this thing. Then you see layers and nuance and you can really kind of chew on some of these things. So, okay, that's it. Here's the reveal. And then I'm going to do this. And then you can all just check your email now because the rest of you, I'm just going to talk about this some more. So the, first, the C is composable. Code should be composable. It should play well with others. Okay. Um, you, Unix philosophy. So Unix is 50 years old, 50 something years old. So am I. Me and Unix are about the same age. Um, Unix does one thing. So, so the point about Unix, one of the things that makes it enduring, that makes it, that gives it this longevity, is this idea that in Unix, every command does one thing, one and only one thing, and it does it well. And that is the, the, the place that does that. Again, I'm going to unpack each of these separately. Predictable. It does what I expect. It does what I expect again and again. If it's failing, if it's buggy, it's the same buggy each time. Because if it's different buggy each time, whew, I'm in a world of, of asynchronous hurt. Um, idiomatic. Uh, uh, idiomatic. You write code like everyone else writes code. Right? Idiomatic is hard for people with big egos because it means you have to leave your ego at the door. And some people don't like that. Some people really struggle with that. Make your code look like everyone else's code, even if everyone else's code is wrong. Right? That's hard. <laughs> Sam Newman gave me one of my favorite, he doesn't remember saying this. I remember being in the room when he said this. Um, we were on a project in 2005 or something. And again, it was something about the way WebLogic, if anyone remembers WebLogic application server, was configured. And I'm like, well, it's, it's, that's not how you do it. And he said, right, but it's not how you do it on seven of the eight machines. Let's make it also not how you do it on the eighth machine. And he said, I'd rather things are, inconsist are consistently wrong than inconsistently anything. And I was enlightened, right? You know, if they're consistently wrong, we've now, we can now consistently move them forward to consistently better. Uh, D, domain-based. And again, we're going to unpack these. So domain-based, in not just in language, not just DDD, but in structure, and the way we structure code as well. OK. So let's take a look at these. Composable, then. Composable, code that's easy to use gets used, and used, and used, and used again. Right? If it's easy for me to make sense of your code, I can then quickly make a decision about that code. OK. I like code, I like components with a small surface area. Okay, um, exactly what uh, Rich Campbell was talking about in his opening keynote. He says, you know, 
the difference between, say, Apache and IIS or something like Node.js is Apache and IIS had, came with all the tools out. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of things you could do, massive surface area. Node just went, what do you want? At the moment, I do nothing. Can you do nothing and be a web server? Yes. <laughs> Can you do nothing and be a web server and read a file? Yes. <laughs> yes. And so gradually, you kind of bolt bits onto it. So small surface area. And again, actually using Node's a really good example of this because in Node, Typically, every single module has two things. It's an event emitter and an event consumer. And if you understand events, you've pretty much got node down, right? It gets a bit more funky with promises and stuff, but promises are just a way for human beings to manage the asynchrony of events, right? It's all, you know, when you get to this, it's, it's events all the way down till you get to turtles. Small surface area, there's less to learn, less to go wrong, less to conflict. I, I think the very first open source thing I wrote is called a thing called XJB, and I know we're mostly a Microsoft gang here. I, I grew up on the, on the enterprise Java side. If you never saw enterprise Java, you're lucky. If you did, I hope the, P, the PTSD counseling is going well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so in particular, like testing, unit, te there's no unit testing in J2E was insane. So IBM had like the biggest, the, 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 the largest market share thing. It's called WebSphere. And WebSphere took about a minute to start. Like your container took a minute to start before you could run your unit test and then tear it down. So imagine that a minute transaction cost per unit test before you've even started the test, right? So I wrote a thing called XJB, which is like testing EJBs, but outside the container. And they would start in microseconds or whatever. And, and that was fun. And I showed it to my buddy and I said, hey, look at this. I wrote some open source. And he said, that's great. Why has it got a dependency on, J on log4j? I'm like, well, because I need logging in there. And he said, well, I don't. If I want to use your thing, I'll use my own logging. So yeah, but everyone's using log4j. He said, yeah, but what if they're not? Or what if they're using a different version? You just made it harder for me to adopt your thing. And I was like, that's annoyingly true. <laughs> so, so I took out all of the logging and just put in hooks. You know, if you want to plug in your own logging, you can. Here's what you'll get, but you don't need anything. Boom. Suddenly loads of people were using it, okay? I, it hadn't occurred to me that something that was convenient for me as a developer was gonna be potentially a massive handicap or even just a deal breaker for someone else who wanted to use my stuff, okay? Small surface area, less to go wrong, less to conflict, versions. Make it say its name. We all love, we all love a silver light pun, right? Um, there's, there's a story, there's a story that um, Selenium, uh, the web testing tool, uh, which came out about the same time HP had Mercury, test director or whatever it's called, Mercury Suite, this huge, massive suite. Uh, Selenium is the antidote to mercury poisoning, okay? Which is cute and clever and not intention revealing at all, okay? Give it an intention revealing name because I'm more likely to find it and make it easy to discover, easy to evaluate. I'm a massive fan of like the two minute tutorial, the 10 minute tutorial. Two minute tutorial says, look at this, within two minutes, you're gonna determine whether or not it's useful. And then there's another thing that within 10 minutes, you'll be able to determine whether it's right for you in this context, okay? And if you can't write, if you can't explain it in two minutes or 10 minutes, it's probably too complicated. And I want minimal dependencies, again. Um, the late, wonderful Joe Armstrong. He said this, he said this about object-oriented languages. He says, you wanted a banana, but you got a whole gorilla. <laughs> right? As opposed to, say, Erlang, where you just have messages. That's the whole thing. The whole of Erlang is processes and messages in mailboxes. That's it. I just described the entire language. Right? In one sentence. Genius. You wanted a banana, but you got a whole gorilla. You got the whole jungle. Yeah? Um, so minimal dependencies, small surface area. Once that's true, or if you move towards that center, you're more likely to make something that I can find useful. I can repurpose, and it might be future I, right? It might be future me doing this. Okay, you, Unix philosophy. So again, <clears throat> Unix started in the, in the late 60s. I started in the late 60s, uh, um, and it's still going. It's, it's on every single, right, it's on your phone. If you're running, uh, if you've got an Android phone, it's on your Mac, it's on Windows. Windows now has you know, first class support. Linux pretty much won the Unix wars, but there's still other Unixes out there. And even when we had in the 90s what were called the Unix wars, so each, you had hardware vendors and each hardware vendor would have their own version of Unix that ran exclusively on their hardware. So HP, IBM, um, DEC, there are a whole bunch of these different hardware companies, Sun, 
uh, all, all had their own versions of Unix. Uh, but they all had this core at the center of each program does one thing well. LS, LS lists files, okay? Um, here's the thing, LS doesn't know about files. There's another command that you probably won't use on a command line called stat or fstat. And stat knows about files and devices and things. And it goes in and it pulls that, it gives you a record, the structured record of data that tells you what kind of a thing it is. Is it a file? Is it a directory? Is it a tape? FIFO, uh, LIFO device, FIFO device, and so on. <clears throat> or is it a network device that's pretending to be a file? Stat comes and gives you information. LS just formats it. So LS is actually a file information formatter. It doesn't list files. It doesn't list directories. And so each of these things works because it does one thing well. And then it's designed to be composable. When you add, combine that with composability, you can make anything. So you can take any set of text and you can do anything with it. Cat gives me the contents of a file, or maybe it might not be a file. It might be a random number generator, or it might be a, a network device that's sucking from a website. I don't know. But cat. Grep then filters that text, said then replaces the filtered text, sort then sorts that, and then unique removes duplicates, and so on and so on and so on. So any type of text transformation is trivial, right, or certainly doable, right, based on these, these little atoms of functionality. So Unix is like, for me, is the epitome of composability and, and um, doing one thing well. But surely that's the same as SRP. No. Again, SRP is from the inside looking out. Do one thing is from the outside looking in. So from the, from the SRP perspective, that says, you know, different people are going to want to change this code for different reasons, put them in separate places. Okay. Um, when there's different people work in different teams and maybe different companies, yes, yeah, sure. When they're in the same team or when they're the same person who now does UI stuff and data and business logic stuff and data stuff because it's just programming, then actually you just give them admin to do, right? So um, yeah, it's about what the code does, not how the code changes, okay? So then, predictable. Um, I think of predictable as a generalization of testable, okay? So Kent Beck in his four, four um, rules of, of, of code, one of his rules, I think the first one is passes all the tests. Like, does it work? And I'm like, yeah, but even when there's no tests. And I asked at the beginning, who's experienced Joyful Code? I first experienced Joyful Code, I've been super lucky in my career, in I think it was probably 91. I was like straight out of college in my first job, and I was learning C on the job. I was hired as a C programmer with no C. So I was a, I was a graduate engineer. I'd done like Pascal and some stuff at college. Um, as these are ancient, so, so Pascal is old enough, you, you, you actually write it in hieroglyphs. You carve it into clay, and then there's some, some people come, and uh, yeah. Um, but then that did become Turbo Pascal, which became Delphi, which was awesome, and then got killed. Uh, but then, so yeah, but so I'm, I'm early in my career, and my first job was working for a digital image processing company. So, digital image processing is you have uh, four color printing, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and you have lots and lots of pixels on a, on a print page. And each of those has a color, which is a four, four of the, you know, a, a four number um, vector. And <clears throat> what would happen is we would do color correction. So the idea is you have an image, a photo of something, and you want that photo to come out looking that color when you print it. Well, all printing inks are different. And so what you do is you would print it, and then you'd rescan it, and then you could do some color correction. And that was basically putting it through a four by four sort of matrix of all the possible color combinations. So that then you're doing a transform of every single dot on the page to its color corrected version. So hugely complicated graphics processing software at a time when like GPUs weren't a thing yet for another 10 years. And I'm there, I'm fairly new and there's a bug, right? There's a bug, what we know is there's a bug. There's a bug and it's somewhere in the code. Hey, new kid, <laughs> I need you to go into the code and find the bug. I'm like, okay, I'll see you in three weeks, right? So, so I went into the code and, and I had that moment. I was like, but I understand this. And I know, I know it's not because I'm a good C programmer because I'm making this up. So it must be whoever wrote it left it for someone who's not a good programmer to read. Yes, thank you, whoever that was. 
And I literally, in minutes, I was navigating the code. It was really obvious where all the call points were and where, all, where I should jump off. And, and I isolated this bug. And I kid you not, it was in a for loop and it was a less than instead of a greater than. It was a simple, simple logic error, one character change. Okay? And I made the one character change pretty confident. We didn't have unit tests or TDD or anything like that then. It was just, you know, I made the one character test change. And then I rebuilt the app. Rebuilt the app takes several hours, right? Compiling is fast. Linking, oof, oof. All the C people, C++, oof. Um, you, you kids today. Anyway, so some time later. But then we ran it. And I was pretty confident. A, I was pretty confident I found the bug. I was pretty confident I fixed the bug. And more importantly, it's what's called impact analysis. I was pretty confident I hadn't caused any more damage. Right? And do you know what? It worked. And I take none of the credit, OK? All of the credit goes to the people, because it was more than one person, the people who had designed this thing, the people who had agreed between them that they were going to do it this way, that they were going to keep each other honest, that idiot graduate kid was going to rock up and be able to make sense of it, right? That, thank you them, yeah? So when there's no tests, if it's predictable, if the code is predictable, oh, man, that's a joyful thing. Yeah. Uh, I was working on, much more recently, I was working on um, algorithmic trading software, which does use GPUs. Uh, very, very high performing, very you know, firewall, of, uh, a fire hose of, of data coming in, of market data, you know, thousands of messages a second. You're trying to make sense of this and trade algorithmically at the same time. We built this stack from basically nothing up to a very profitable um, set of suite of software. And at one point, I think about a year into this, I ran a code coverage uh, metric on the code base. What was our, um, you know, we're, ver uh, I'd say, rabid XPers, right? Everyone on the team, it's a small team, about four or five people. All of us rabid XPers. What was our test coverage? What was our TDD code coverage on this highly technical um, code base? Have a go. 2%. What, what kind of amateur cowboy do you think we are? 2%. Uh, 7 7% um, code coverage. Uh, here's the thing. It was not evenly distributed. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of the code base had no tests because it didn't need them because the code was so obvious. I mean, you literally, it was like, write these two lines. What, what, what test are you going to write for that that isn't just double entry bookkeeping? Right? It just works. It's so simple and so obvious that it couldn't do anything else. And then you get into the thing that did what's called order management. Order management is a massively asynchronous, very high data volume uh, state machine. And we made up, we invented kinds of testing for that. right? And we were very, very confident that it worked, or at least that it worked to everything we could think of and some things we couldn't. And so, <clears throat> so pass all the tests, yeah, sure. But when you don't have tests, that's still a thing. But it's not just about behavior. It's not just about functionality. It's that I want to see what it's like when it's running. Okay? So it does the same thing every time, even if it's buggy. It's buggy the same way every time. But it's operating characteristics. I know how much memory it uses. I know how much CPU it uses. I know if I see it start spiking, that's probably a bad thing. Or I know if I see it start spiking, that's completely normal, and it's going to level out and go down again in a minute. There it goes. Right, we're back. It's all fine. Right? I know when I should be nervous. Yeah. And so this is all about observability. And you know, I love that observability is becoming a thing rather than monitoring. Uh, I know charity majors, Mipsy Tipsy, has been banging on about this for probably over a decade um, in a very sweary way. But lots of other people as well are now picking up that you, you can't make something observable. You design an observable thing. Okay? It's a characteristic of a system you build. And so observability is, a, again, a part of predictability. <clears throat> this is where it gets interesting, because this is where you get into like opinions, OK? So <clears throat> I'm a fan, and it took me a long time to realize this, like again, to articulate it. And one of the great things, <clears throat> and it is a huge indulgence, being allowed to give a talk, being invited to give a talk. It's an indulgence in that you get to noodle on something really, really, really deeply. I mean, I presume most of you are in Rich Campbell's keynote just then. I was sitting there uh, about 45, 50 minutes in, just like my jaw. The amount of research 
the amount of just legwork that went into that talk, that little history lesson, is, as someone who puts talks together, is staggering, right? And part of it is like, wow, that's a huge amount of work to ask someone to do. But the other part of it is like, it's almost envy, right? He got to totally nerd out on the history of Microsoft in the last 20 years, right? And I get to totally nerd out on this. So idiomatic code is this, you use the language idioms, okay? Which means you, you need to study the language, okay? When, um, so I, I worked at ThoughtWorks for about eight years in the 2000s. And one of the things that they did, they were very, very early adopters of .NET. Practically as soon as .NET came out, ThoughtWorks said, yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna help companies do that. And how many .NET people do we have? None, they just invented it, right? But here's our bet. Our bet is this, C Sharp is a competitor to Java, right? .NET is a competitor to the, J, to the JVM and the Java runtime. And they are playing in the same enterprise space. The problems, the problems that you will be solving in C Sharp won't be C Sharp problems. They will be business problems. We're really good at that. So we're gonna be really good at that in this new technology. Okay, so you know, language idioms are, might be um, the way you solve problems. Uh, Martin Fowler, again, wrote this wonderful book, um, Patterns of Application Architecture. And they, so he's got all these design patterns and refactoring patterns. These are patterns of how businesses work because they're standard repeatable patterns of how businesses work. Language idioms, I want to understand the standard features, the constructs, libraries, frameworks, tools, okay? I need to learn those things because here's the thing. I, I learned Python probably about 12 years ago. I started using Python and I was very much Ruby. I like Ruby. Python was weird because white space, hey, that's wrong. Um, turns out it's completely fine, right? Um, but I learned Python, and so I started writing Python. All my Python was objects and classes and methods because I came from Java. And so I wasn't writing Python, I was writing Java in Python. Yeah? And it turns out that when you start writing Python in Python, all the code goes away. It's weird. It's like runnable pseudocode. And so, so for instance, the Python, the brilliant, brilliant in, um, Python sort of default test framework is called PyTest. And the built-in one is called TestUnit, which is um, based on JUnit and SUnit and all of those. So you have a, a test case class and it has methods in and each method is a test and all of that. And then PyTest said, uh, you don't need any of that. You're gonna have a function called test something. And if you have a function called test something, I'll run it. Well, how are you gonna, how are you gonna assert things? We're gonna use the word assert built into the language. Assert, you know, A equals equals B. And when it fails, I'm gonna give you the best looking error messages you've ever seen. I will practically fix your test for you, right? It's weirdly, but the whole thing is that Python itself has a mindset, it has a culture, it has a word Pythonic, right? Um, there's a wonderful Easter egg in Python. If you go to the command line and you run Python minus M this, or in, in a Python file, import this, and it doesn't do anything. It's a no-op import with a side effect. And the side effect is it prints a bunch of aphorisms about Python. It says things like explicit is better than implicit, right? There should only be one obvious way to do things. Yeah, a bunch of just, just good programming advice, but it's the Python way. And when you learn, when you start to write Python like Python people, suddenly A, your code becomes much, much more understandable to you in Python, but more importantly, right, future you or not you, other Python people. And so learning the idioms and using the idioms means that you're writing for everyone else in that ecosystem. And writing code for other people in an ecosystem is a very humbling thing. It's a very powerful thing. It's a brilliant, brilliant communication thing. This is how you write habitable code is you write it in an idiomatic way. And what does idiomatic mean? Well, it might mean the way the world does things is a bit different from how we do things here, okay? So we, it's kind of layered. So you've got like how the world does stuff, um, how we do stuff in our organization, and then within that, how we do stuff in our team or in this particular code base. And those things may not exist. And so what you'll find is that certain languages are more opinionated, more idiomatic, more obviously idiomatic than others. So. I, again, I'm sort of from a Java heritage, so I tend to use uh, Scala and Clojure as like the opposite ends of the spectrum here. But maybe, I don't know, something like F-sharp and C-sharp would be pretty good, right? In C-sharp, you can write 
the same looping construct in half a dozen different ways. You know, you've got closures, you've got for loops, you've got iterators, you've got, um, um, uh, what's it called? Um, map, uh, map reduce sort of function chaining. So th there's a bunch of different ways to do that. And you say, oh, great, okay, so what should we use? And the answer is yes. What do you mean yes? Oh, just whatever, right? And if you get a nested loop, guess what? One of them will be one and one of them will be another thing. Yeah. In closure, like closure, or the, the entire language is a parentheses. It's a lisp, right? Now these are your father's parentheses. And it's, a very, it's really hard to not see. Has anyone used Go? Anyone programming in Go? Right, a few hands went up. Okay. So Go is, my favorite description of Go, a chap called Nat Price, he said, it's such an ugly language. The only thing you can do with it is work. <laughs> Just designed to do work in because it's a really ugly language. But here's the thing: Go comes with it ships with a with a formatter called Go Format, and Go Format formats your code, and your code now looks like everyone else's Go code. And I'm pretty sure that the whole thing is just this massive um, uh, troll, right? So what they've done is they said, right, we're going to take uh, all of the different ways that you could structure. You know, where do you put your curly braces? All that kind of thing. You know, tabs versus spaces. And for every single one, we're going to annoy someone. Right? So I'm not kidding. So it uses tabs for indentation, left indentation. It uses tabs. That's illegal in many states. Okay. <laughs> so it uses tabs. But then, but then, if you have multiple assignments, it lines up all the equals. Is it puts white space in? I'm like, oh, that just appeals to my OCD. <laughs> I can almost forgive the tab thing. But then the curly braces. I'm not even going to tell you. But the thing is, right? It's wrong for some value of wrong for everyone and no one cares. Because then all of the tutorial code you see looks like that. All of the standard library code you see looks like that. All the example code you see. And it's more importantly, when you crack open someone else's code base, it looks like that. A whole load of design, a whole load of formatting decisions just got taken off the table. If you don't have that in your language, have that as a standard in your team. And it's as simple as just putting a, you know, a format as you type thing in your IDE. If you're using VS Code or Visual Studio or uh, Rider or whatever you're doing, you know, whatever you're doing your, your day job in, have a standard across the team and make it at least so that it formats it before it commits, right? So that all of the code under version control looks the same. You put it out, oh, look, I could have written that. But then it gets into things like naming. Naming's hard, right? It goes into things like naming, structure, where you put things, all of that stuff is all idiomatic. One of my favorite examples of an idiom is um, if you go to Devon, uh, there's a word in Devon for someone who's not from Devon. Do you know what that word is? Anyone? It's a grockle. A grockle is someone who's not from Devon. Next door in Somerset, there's a word for someone who's not from Somerset. Do you know what that word is? It's not grockle. It's Emmet. Right? So two neighboring counties have this totally different words. For, and I, for me, that is like the epitome of idiomatic because everyone there knows what it means. And they're the only people who need to. And technically, a grockle is someone who doesn't know what a grockle is. <laughs> and an emmet is someone who doesn't know what an emmet is. Right? So they're the same thing. Um, local idioms, they may not exist. You may need to retrofit them. And this is Sam's, you know, consistently wrong. Right? Whatever we're doing, clearly it was copied and pasted from one origin script or whatever. Um, let's at least make everything look like that and then we can improve it all in sort of in lockstep. You can only write idiomatic code if you bother. Okay, idiomatic code is a choice, it's an investment. I cannot write idiomatic F sharp if I come straight from C sharp and start typing. Okay, I'm going to get a lot of very C sharp looking F sharp. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I can, you know, it, it's when you shift paradigms like that, when you go from like an OO paradigm into a functional paradigm, you kind of want mutable state everywhere. You know, because that's what you're used to. What do you mean I can't reassign to a variable? It's called a variable, damn it. <laughs> the clue's in the name, right? What do you mean it's not? So idiomatic code. Um, and finally, domain-based. So joyful code uses the language of the domain, okay? Um, I wrote, uh, I contributed a one thing to 97 things every programmer should know. And the one thing I contributed was this code in the language of the domain. And I've got an example in there of like a, a nested map of ints of maps to ints to ints. And, and you kind of, you unpack this and 
and you realize that actually it's not. It's a, it's a business rule about um, what they call Chinese walls, which is like a, a privacy thing inside banks that you're not allowed to see both sides of a trade, which is if you get it wrong is illegal. You're literally breaking the law, right? And this rule, and this was real code, this rule was hidden away in some nested map of ints to ints because there was nothing in there about the domain. Same code base about six months later, um, and this was, I, I had a real epiphany about DDD at this point, domain driven design is there was uh, someone leaning over a desk, and there's two programmers, right? And they were sitting there pairing, I like pairing, sitting there pairing, and there's a trader standing behind, or an analyst or something, some kind of financial person. And they were, they were discussing how pricing works, pricing of trades, and pricing of trades is a huge complicated domain. And I, I kind of was a bit of shoulder surfing and looking in, and I realized something, which is that the programmers were talking about the code, and the analyst was talking about the domain, and neither of them noticed, right? Whoa, yeah, because the domain, the code so naturally modeled the domain that they collapsed into the same space. Talking about what the code did and talking about how the domain works were the same thing, right? Cognitive load goes away. I can reason about the problem in code. I manipulate code to make it say what the domain rule is and then I'm done, right? Pub o'clock, woohoo. Um, but not just domain language, domain structure. And this is a, this is a big deal. So um, Rich mentioned um, uh, Rails this morning. And Rails, I would say, Rails is the progenitor of this, certainly the biggest culprit for this, only because it was so insanely popular. And every framework ever since has done this. It has um, boilerplate. It'll give you a template project. And the template project it gives you has models, views, controllers, helpers, utils, uh, oh, loads and loads of stuff. Um, and, and that's where, you, and it basically says, let's just put your code in here. And this is, you know, this is single responsibility principle on steroids, right? Is that not only is the, the, the logic for getting my data, uh, having business rules, and presenting that data in three different files, they're in three different directories, they're not even in the same place. They're not even close to each other. And so now what happens is every time I crack open a Rails code base, I learn nothing about the domain. I learn about Rails, well, I already know that, right? <laughs> I know where, I know whether you have models and views and controls. I know I'm gonna need these things, but I'd much rather have all of the payments code together because that's likely what I'm, I'm unlikely to go in and want to change all the views. I'm much more likely to want to go in and change how payments work. That's much more of a real thing, right? And when I change how payments work, because I'm an adult, I can get the data, I can process the data, and I can present the data. Check me out, right? Because it's not that hard, yeah, it turns out. And because we don't have different people in different teams doing this over eight months. We have the same people co-located all as buddies going out for lunch together, doing it in eight minutes. And at that point, single responsibility, separation of code no longer makes sense. In fact, it hasn't since the 90s, it hasn't since refactoring. And again, I'll say it again, solid when it came out in the mid 90s, much like Scrum when it came out was revolutionary. It was a brilliant set of ideas. Scrum said, instead of 18 months, we're gonna ship in 12 weeks. And we're also gonna check in after six weeks with each other, not checking code. We're gonna check in after six weeks to make sure we're on track, we're gonna have a showcase. Six week sprints, 12 week releases. Releasing once a season, right, it was considered impossible in the early 90s, yeah. So that was brilliant, but we're still suggesting it's good. Right, 30 years later. But we don't, we don't have those constraints anymore, therefore the solution is the solution to a redundant problem. And also domain boundaries. <clears throat> so this is now about deployability. Not necessarily what we deploy, but the options for deployment. So um, I want the domain boundaries to align with module boundaries, to align with units of deployment boundaries. So the payments, I can, I can release the payments code completely independently from the loans code. I can release subsystems within that completely independently, or I can manage them completely independently. So this kind of starts to describe an architectural style. So here we are. So we've got, um, so Cupid then, composable, plays well with others, Unix philosophy, does one thing and only one thing, and does all of that one thing. Idiomatic, it feels natural to whom? To someone who isn't you, to someone who is already in that world whether that is a F-sharp world or a ASP.NET world or a 
C sharp world or whatever it is, right? They are going to look at that code and they're going to go, I recognize that. And in your team, a really, really good acid test, a really good heuristic is when you look at code, you don't know who wrote it. If you don't know who wrote it, you are epically winning at idiomatic, okay? And domain based, right? It's impossible to look at the code and not know what problem it's solving. If you don't know what problem it's solving, because it's a map of ints to ints, you've blown it, okay? So <clears throat> how do we apply this? And this is great, because again, we're a year into this now. I've been talking about this for a year, and I'm getting feedback, and people are saying, you know what, I use your cube for assessing a code base. I inherited this code base. I'm like, what, how much of a mess have I got, right? I'm assessing a code base. Um, I'm going to use Cupid to do that. And he started feeding back on Twitter about kind of, I just noticed this and this and this. John Skeet is uh, building something. In fact, he's doing the next talk. In the next lot, he's building something for his church, uh, um, an application. Because that's what happens when, if you go to church and you're technical, you're on the website, right? <laughs> you know, if you go to church and you're an accountant, you're on the finance, right? Um, so we're building, a, building a, 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 an application for them. And, and, and we were chatting and he said, you know what, I'm going to use your Cupid to figure out how to do this well or to figure out what we've already got and make sense of it. So I'm kind of excited about where that's going. Um, basis for a code critique. So this is, um, uh, this is a deliberate term I've introduced. So who likes code reviews? Who does code reviews? Yeah, there you go. So just for, for, the, for the camera, um, most people do code reviews. No one likes them. Uh, two people like them. I'm sorry, I'm the opposite camp. I love code reviews. But I love code reviews in the David Marquet turn the ship around sense where he talks about in, uh, encouraging inspection, inviting inspection. So I use the word code critique because it's just because it's different words. Because it isn't, doesn't lo isn't loaded. So a code critique is like a movie critique. It's like you get a bunch of you around and you chat about it. And the goal isn't to say what you did wrong. I'm policing your code and you're wrong. And not only are you wrong, you're wrong after the facts and now you have to go back and fix it all. Gotcha. No, that's mean. Don't be that person, right? Code critique is maybe we've noticed that two or three people have been working on similar things. And we've got two or three different solutions have kind of emerged in the code base. And so what we as a team are going to do is say, what's our, what's our opinion going to be on that? Um, are we going to take... Um, John's thing, and then that means that we're going to have to make the other things kind of line up to that, or are we going to take Daniel's thing? And, and typically what happens when you do a code critique in that way, um, you end up with a greater than the sum of the parts thing. Like, I, I like what you did there, but there's this other thing here, and whoa, and we could make some observability. We can make that observable, but oh, not. And so now we go and change all of them, and they're all better, and that's very exciting. Okay, so code critique is, and we're applying Cupid properties to our code critique. What would make this more composable, right? Why aren't people using it? Oh, because it drags in this library, which drags in that library, which means you've got to pull in a Docker image. And oh, crap, no wonder. Can we get rid of it? Well, hang on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so on. Um, when you've got legacy code base, OK? I use the word scary instead of legacy. So legacy, my working definition of legacy is two things. It is code that is valuable, right? It's paying the bills. If it's not paying the bills, switch it off. Oh, you can't, can you? It's paying the bills, right? And you're scared to change it. And you're scared to change it because not Cupid, right? Because it's massively coupled and hairy and not intentional revealing or any of those things, right? So I've got this big, scary code base. Where do I start? Well, I start with one of those assessments, but with a deliberate then, right, where's the most, you know, theory of constraints. Which, which aspect of this is giving us the most pain right now? And because they're all intertwingled, it's great because you start making something more idiomatic and it turns out to be more predictable. Or you know, because you're now using better trodden libraries or whatever, or you start making something more composable and as you break it apart, each piece becomes more predictable or more idiomatic. So you tend to kind of get this win-win-win. And then as a syllabus for a programming course that I haven't written yet, right? But absolutely not for certification. There will be no certification. But I think teaching young people or people transitioning into technology, um, that these are, that applying these pro properties, that, that thinking about these properties will make code that you will love working in and that other people will love working in is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, so we're live, so what I did is I wrote it up eventually, this article, I said about a year later, um, and I've now, and it's 5,000 words. And so what I've done is I've busted it into a little Hugo website, cupid.dev, um, 
and Cupid.dev is it's a really simple website. It's, it's, as I say, it's Hugo, it's Markdown. Um, you'll notice there case studies, resources, TBD, very TBD. I'm on the lookout for case studies. If you're writing stuff about this or you're doing stuff or you've been chatting with your friends or you make a podcast or something, let me know and I'll put it in here or I'll share the URL to this code base and you can make a pull request because it's on GitHub. Um, so, so this is there. So I'd love you to have a play with that. And there's also a news group. And the news group is so new that anyone in this room could be the first post. <laughs> OK. So there is a Cupid joyful code. Um, it turns out there's an awful lot of news groups called Cupid, and they're nothing to do with programming. <laughs> Things you discover when you Google for tractors, right? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so that's me. And thank you very much for, for coming along and listening. Yeah. I don't know if I'm about to get cut or if I have time for one question. Someone who knows better than me. They haven't stopped me. Who's got a question? <laughs> I'll take a question. Or I'll suggest you all go get coffee. Oh, the question is, where's the good coffee? It's at the far, the far left end on the side there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>